because I've been listening to this guy, Dr. Sean Baker, and he's pretty easy on the eyes too. He says, she said, give him a listen. He's carnivore. I said, okay, whatever. I was still not at all <laughs> convinced that meat was the way to go. But I thought, he looks great. It's a guy thing. This way of eating is the first time. Like I do not fall back in the ditch ever. I may choose to someday have a piece of cake like you do sometimes, but I don't desire it. I don't have any problems with pushing the carbs away. And it's just been so freeing that the food freedom is huge for me. I'm just feeling better than I ever have in my entire life. And I started thinking, oh, maybe I need fruit. I'll add it back in some fruit and honey. That didn't work for me. That was just going right down that whole carb addiction path. If there was a whole bunch of grapes, I'm going to eat every single one of them. So many crazy things started happening health-wise that I knew that I needed to stick with pretty clean carnivore. Okay. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Today we have Barbara with us. Barbara, good morning. How are you today? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Good to see you. Where are you located? Looks like you're in a nice place. Nice area there. I am in South Central Illinois, about a little under two hours Northeast of St. Louis. Okay. I lived in Illinois when I was a kiddo, but up near Chicago and I'm in kind of the South Chicago Heights area. So haven't been there in a while, but it's a nice time of the year. I know the winters can be a little challenging sometimes, that it, it gets sunny and it's nice. Welcome. Tell us, I guess you're going to share your success story with us. Tell us, I guess, give us a little background. Tell us where you started and all that stuff. I have a typical story, I think, for women my age. I'm 54 years old. I have three grown children, a grandbaby on the way, like any day, she's ready to pop. <laughs> and about when I was 11 years old, I started exercising and calorie restricting. By the time I was a freshman in high school, I even had a little anorexic period where I lost a lot of hair, just eating little to nothing for quite some time, but I never was hospitalized or anything like that. It wasn't not that serious. And then just for the like, pretty much the next 42 years, I've calorie restricted and exercised excessively and been up and down on the weight and I'm assuming the hormones as well. And uh, then about five years ago, I started. I, became a vegan, started the vegan thing. I don't know what was the documentary, what the health, I should have looked that up. Anyway, watched one of those, was completely convinced that, oh my gosh, yeah, cannot eat animals anymore or animal products. So did that for about a year, lost some weight, lost a lot more hair. And uh, then about four years ago, I did the, I tried the ketogenic diet. I don't think I knew exactly what I was doing with that. I wasn't I've been low protein my entire life, and I still did too low fat with that keto diet. And uh, anyway, that's a background with the dieting. I don't think I did any of my diets correctly, but most of my life I've calorie restricted, exercise excessively, binge eating is completely a part of my everyday yo-yo dieting for many years. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I think we'll delve into some of those things. One of the things is with this chronic caloric restriction often comes binge eating because it's a reflux because a reflexive I'm starving. <laughs> Let me eat something because you're restricting yourself all the time. I'll have to say at 54, you look much younger than that. You look great for 54. So kudos to you <laughs> doing something well over, over the years, apparently. And exercise, you said exercise was always part of this and probably an effort just to maintain a particular body. I've been exercising for gosh, 40 some years. I think it's a great healthy outlet for sure, but it can be taken to certainly to an extent to be excessive. I guess I'll go to, oh, you said there was a period of time where you were, you felt anti anorexic or something like that. Tell us about what was going on then. How were you, what was going on mentally with you? Was there some sort of, uh, and how did you come to that conclusion that you're anorexic or nearly anorexic? I was very young. I was probably only 14 or 15 years old, freshman year in high school. And I was in volleyball. And I remember seeing pictures of myself. I looked okay. I was really skinny, but uh, just uh, I wasn't eating. And I just would stay in my room all the time and not eat. And once you stop eating for some time, it really doesn't bother you anymore. It's like fasting. And I can do that now with no problem and no, no relapse of that whatsoever because I like to eat too much now. <laughs> but yeah, that was a problem then. And then just after that, just struggling, the struggle bus for, oh my gosh, my entire life, <laughs> going through all that with just the calorie restriction and the binge eating. I was never bulimic. 
anything like that. Um, but yeah, I've always been health conscious and, and then I became a big runner. So then of course that was even more hardship on my body affecting my cortisol levels and just my hormones. I just feel like my hormones have been messed up most of my life and maybe now I'm getting them in uh, under check and under control. I'm two years older than you. So you grew up in the eighties where I think at that time it was super thin. I think that was in vogue for women at that time, as I recall. And now it's swung the other way where they're promoting even obesity in some ways. So you had sort of that. Do you remember uh, the diet you're eating when you're, when you're not restricting, what kind of diet makeup was it? Because it's some food is easier to eat less calories than others. Were you constantly hungry with this trying to restrict all the time? And what kind of food were you eating back then? I would thank God it's Friday. Oh God, it's Monday. I would binge on the weekends and start right all over again on Monday and just the calorie restricted and exercise heavily Monday through Friday. And uh, sometimes crash in the evenings if I was so tired. When you're tired, you tend to overeat. So that was my entire adult life. And I've never, this way of eating is the first time. Like I do not fall back in the ditch ever. I may choose to someday have a piece of cake like you do sometimes, but I don't, I don't desire it. I don't have any problems with pushing the carbs away. And it's just been so freeing The the food freedom is huge for me. I'm just feeling better than I ever have in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty powerful statement. And I do think a lot of people look at it as a very restrictive diet, but in a lot of people, we do feel it's freeing because you're free from all these sort of cravings and, and these, and it's really erratic bad behavior. When you were binging, what was like the weekday diet was what? And then the binging was what kind of food were you consuming on the week versus the weekend? The weekly diet was maybe a salad at lunch, just something light and snacks throughout the day, healthy snacks, fruit or whatever, and then just come home and then just be so starving that I would if there's a half a bag of Doritos left. I'm finishing it off. If there's thin mint cookies, the Girl Scout cookies, they're gone. I just, there was never just eat one. Yeah, know, I think, I, I think <laughs> one of the problems with trying to restrict calories in, in a chronic fashion is you, you just get so hungry and, and you often relapse into these high energy dense foods and often they're junk food and they're designed specifically for that because they give us that need for energy that we have. And of course, it's without much nutrition in, on top of that in many cases. But you did this for many years. You had children. You said you had a little grandbaby on the way. Congratulations. I'm still, my, my kids are still young. So I don't want, they're too young to have grandkids. If they have grandkids anytime near soon, something went wrong that wasn't supposed to happen. But you, did you have any, any outside of just this behavior of, of bad behavior when it came to nutrition, did you have any health issues that came up? Did you have any kind of, I don't know, mental health, any kind of physical things that, that occurred to you? Oh yeah. My pretty much my entire life. I've, I'm pretty type two personality or type A that is <laughs> type A personality. So very high strung, anxious, and then starting within my 40s, late 40s, I started getting a lot of brain fog as well. With this way of eating, even though it's only been a year, coming up on a year, I have just so much calmness. Even preparing for this interview, I normally would have been freaking myself out with thinking about what I was going to say and writing notes. And I'm just so much more calm. So anxiety and the brain fog. I, I can think on my feet a lot quicker. Just I get so many more tasks done in a day, also with the energy. But yeah, just been very anxious person most of my life. Let me ask you about. So you said there was a period of time where you were convinced to try veganism. You saw the film What the Health, and it's, to the credit, they're very good at putting out this sort of very compelling, emotionally driven documentaries that convince a lot of people to do this. It's a lot of times it's science. It's sort of science. They use a lot of just incomplete science and. They compel a lot of people to do it. So I don't blame anybody for falling for that. But uh, was there some, did you just happen to watch it one day or was it, did someone convince you, hey, watch this film and think about veganism? How did the veganism thing enter your life? I think I just watched it on my own and just maybe somebody did say something to me about it at work. But yeah, I remember visiting my daughter in Phoenix and she was taking me to these wonderful German restaurants and all these restaurants. And you talk about restrictive when you can't have meat at a German restaurant, <laughs> you're left with sauerkraut and, and what? It was terrible. <laughs> and of course, then I did realize the importance of protein and fat. So again, constantly hungry and then binging on the stuff that you can eat Doritos and Oreos, right? That's vegan. <laughs> Just 
not a very healthy nutrients my entire life. I feel like I've been nutrient deprived for sure. You watch, so you saw this, what the hell? And I think I've been to some of those German restaurants in Phoenix when I used to live there and I had some cool <laughs> good ones, but when you, so you, you watch the movie, what was it? Was it the health message? Was it the save the animals message? What was the thing that said, Hey, I want to do this now? It was both. Of course, I was appalled at how they show what they do to the animals, but I really thought it was more healthy. I really did. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of people do. A lot of people do. They're very, very strong about their message about this is the most healthiest way to be and yeah. so on and so forth. And a lot of the, a lot of the animal films, they, t- they often take those out of context and you don't know what the whole context is, but they tend to show this, the worst of the worst in many cases to get their point across. Sometimes even paying people to abuse. Now there's actually evidence that they've actually paid people to abuse animals so they could film them. Just it's just crazy that they would that would they would even support doing that. But so what? So how did you start with veganism? Were you was it whole food type of stuff, or was it just vegan junk food, or how did you roll this out? It was mostly healthy whole foods as far as veg and uh, fruits go. I was feeling better in the beginning, and then I started losing my hair, like really thinning out my hair. So I got on biotin and then just a crap ton of other supplements that I literally took over 20 pills a day. I kid you not. And it was just an array because I listened to everything that you need to have when you're on this diet. And none of it clicked with me. Like, why do you need to be on all these supplements if you're getting everything that you need from your foods? (laughs) If you're eating the whole most nutrient dense foods that there are on the planet, then why am I needing to eat all of these supplements? And then, yeah, you'd seen that. Do you think that might be a little bit of a clue in there? But a lot of people fall under the spell. They're persuaded by this. And so, where who informed you on where to eat your diet? Was it from the? Was there a book? Was there someone you followed? Are those is the Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen or the McDougal Plan or the? Actually, you know, none of that. I just. And where did you get it from? None of that. I just looked it up on my own. I guess the internet. I didn't really read a particular book or anything like that. Just winged it on my own. And of course, that's always hard preparing food for your family when you're ricing your cauliflower and making your whatever, and then they still want pasta. And, or I guess I could eat pasta back then. I ate a lot of pasta back then. That's what it was. <laughs> a lot of pasta. I didn't like to make meat back then because I wasn't going to eat it, but then I still had to do that for the family. Oh, so your family wasn't in on the vegan. They weren't voting for vegan, huh? Oh, no. <laughs> no. Good for them. <laughs> All right. So you did that for you separate. I think you said four years of it, right? Is that correct? I did one year veganism. Oh, one year veganism. Okay. Yeah. I was tired of the hair falling out. <laughs> and then, then I went to keto, which okay. worked really well for a while. Okay. So the, in the one year of veganism, what was, the, I mean, you obviously you said, I don't like the way animals are treated. What was the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, to say, I just can't do this anymore. Where were you at? What made that decision? Yeah. I didn't feel good. I was still running then. My runs were terrible. I wasn't sleeping well and losing all the hair. So just all those things that were happening. I just okay. didn't feel good. And you're just like, why don't I feel good? This is not me. I don't feel like me. Did did you attempt to say, I'm not feeling good on vegan? Did anybody try to help you out with that to try to say, hey, do this, do that, take this different supplement or anything like that? You just no. Okay. So you just, <laughs> you just... meat and eggs and meat. <laughs> okay. So what so when you decided that a year and you said, I'm tired of not sleeping. My exercise performance going well down. I don't feel good. My hair is all falling out. What, what did you eat? And then how did you, how did you reintroduce animal products back in the diet? And how- I slowly transitioned to basically a high carb keto diet. So not even, I'm sure my carbs were still not even under a hundred per day. So I still had the high carb thing. And I don't start doing the fat bombs. You start doing the keto treats. And I was just a very dirty keto. So again, still, in my opinion, a standard American crap, atrocious diet is what I was still on, even with keto and then still taking all of the supplements because I still was not feeling like myself at all. When you, when you were vegan and then on this early phase of this quote unquote dirty keto with all the products and stuff, were you still restricting and binging? And was it still that sort of scenario going on? Absolutely. Yeah. I would always fall back in the ditch. I, I've never been able to get rid of carb cravings and alcohol problems. And so, yeah, I was always there. Like I said, I try to be good Monday through Friday and then evenings and weekends still too hungry, still not satisfied. 
Okay. Cause you, and you mentioned alcohol in there. So is that something you would binge on alcohol as well? Is this, they go hand in hand so much or no? Not necessarily binging, but definitely, um, I, I guess you would call it an addiction because I needed it every day. <laughs> I needed it every day until I became carnivore. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But then a lot of times with alcohol, it just, our decision-making process doesn't work as well. And we tend to eat things. That's one of the problems with alcohol. If you have a couple of drinks and all of a sudden that appetizer tray or whatever of garbage looks a little easier and you just kind of start eating them and then it comes a very slippery slope. You went from standard American binging diet to veganism, felt a little bit better than felt awful. Then you went on keto and you said, did that make you initially feel a little better? I guess maybe recovering from veganism, getting some animal products and might've helped. It did make me, it did make me feel better. And so where did, the, where did the decision to go carnivore? Were you still just not feeling good? And you decide I'm going to try this crazy carnivore thing. I see these crazy people out there saying that just eating meat isn't, that's gotta be nutty. Right. So what made you decide to go that route? It's an interesting story. I went down the, whole, um, and I still admire this person, uh, David Sinclair rabbit hole. I went down that whole rabbit hole longevity, of course, trying to be healthier. And then I think he's become pretty strict vegetarian right now. I don't know that he's vegan, but he's vegetarian. And I just, the longevity thing is what stuck with me. He would always talk about the proof is there. The proof is there. You've got your blue zones. You've got your Okinawa and you've got the proof is there that longevity is going to come from eating a plant-based diet and that the less meat you eat, of course, the less mTOR you're going to produce and you're going to just live so much longer. And I even started taking all the supplements he was taking. So went down that supplement path again and then, so I'm on my way to St. Louis with my friend. I'm a yoga instructor and we were going to a yoga class in St. Louis, about two hours away from where we live. And uh, I was telling her about Davis and Claire and about not doing the, uh, not doing meat that means so unhealthy. I'm just going to stick with vegetables again. And uh, she says, well, that's not what I've heard. She says, I've been listening to this guy, Vinny Tortorich on this podcast of his, I think it's called Fitness Confidential. And uh, she says, you really need to give him a listen. So. I did after taking her to a vegan restaurant in St. Louis. <laughs> so I did. And uh, yeah, so I started doing NSNG. This was about April, 2022. And then she goes, Hey, there's this guy you've got to listen to on Vinnie Tortorich. He had a show with him the other day. His name's Sean Baker, Dr. Sean Baker. And he's pretty easy on the eyes too. He said, she said, give him a listen. He's carnivore. I said, okay, whatever. Yeah. So I listened to it. I was still not at all <laughs> convinced that meat was the way to go by that. He looks great. It's a guy thing. Started going down the whole listening to all of the influencers on Instagram for sure. And then lots and lots more podcasts. I found Dr. Anthony Chafee and uh, Dr. Ken Berry. Of course, I was listening to your podcast. And that's when it all started coming together. And that only took a month or two to where actually her and I both at the same time pretty much started carnivore last June. So we're coming up on our year anniversary. But literally until that time, I was never, never free of my carb addiction, never free of needing alcohol every day. So until that happened, yeah, I would have known nothing about how this way of eating makes you feel. And you don't know how bad you feel until you feel good. And so many people that I know would feel so much better if they gave it a try. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because there's a, now there's a confluence of people, a lot of people with the same message. I've been, of course, I've been on Vinny's show a couple of times and going back even several years, many years ago. And obviously that's a good start to remove the grain and the sugar for a lot of people, even on a vegan diet. It can be, you know, those things are commonly problematic for a lot of people. And then obviously you, you, here's this crazy guy and there's another crazy guy and there's another, and then all of a sudden you start seeing all these people and all of a sudden it's just, we start putting up results. And I think that's the that message I have results are. What sell this thing? We just got people that did over and over again. They get the results. And so, how did you start? What did you, when you started carnivore? What was the first couple of days, first couple of weeks? What did you start out by trying? Basically, just ruminant meat. I really wasn't great on chicken there. Water, salt, eggs, beef, butter, bacon, eggs, and I was still doing my avocados then because I literally just started cutting out all veg. At one point, I was listening to Dr. You know, Paul Saladino, and I was started thinking, oh, maybe I need fruit. I'll add it back in some fruit and honey. That didn't work for me. That was just going right down that whole carb addiction path. If there was a whole bunch of grapes, I'm going to eat every single one of them. And that, I knew that wasn't going to work. And I had already cleared up so many issues with my digestive issues and 
skin condition. And so I, so many crazy things started happening health wise that I knew that I needed to stick for me. I needed to stick with pretty clean carnivore. Yeah. Interesting. And a lot of, a lot of people, they hear an argument and they, we, 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 fruit is natural and all this sugar and we're supposed to eat this stuff. And yet people try it. And often they end up with a lot of troubles. Like you said, particularly when you said you always live with this binging craving type of thing. And it's, I, I liken it to either alcohol or heroin or something like that. You don't tell a heroin addict, you can shoot up once a week. We're going to fix you. It's usually, it's an all or nothing thing for a lot of people. And it takes that to solve these issues for many people. So when did you know, like something was different? At what point, how long did it take you to say, wow, this is really impactful and different than anything else I've ever experienced? When did that sort of point come into you? Several things happen within the first couple of days, all bloating and indigestion, GERD, anything like that, it's completely gone. So that right there felt amazing, but I'm like, oh, but can I stick to it? Of course, you're eating healthy. You're not eating crap anymore. Of course, your stomach is going to feel flat. Of course, you're not going to. I would lay there in, in bed at night after eating like something I shouldn't have eaten. And then just your belly's churning. You can't sleep. So immediately digestive issues. Then came better sleep, better sleep. And I was also experiencing night sweats at the time going through perimenopause. So I lost the night sweats, slept better. And then one day I'm out on my patio, it was probably July. This is a couple of months after starting, maybe August. And all of a sudden I'm like reading this book and I used to have to wear readers to read the book. I even had contacts and I still had to wear readers to read my books just to see that small print. And I, for some reason I didn't put them on and I'm like, I don't need them. I didn't need them. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. Didn't ever think anything about it. Then one day I'm driving down the road and I can see my speedometer find the inner numbers and then the, they're smaller and then the outer numbers are larger. And I'm coming home from work one day and I can't see those inner numbers anymore. I cannot see them. They're completely blurry. I'm like, what's going on? I can't, out of my right eye that was. Um, so I went to the my eye doctor and he didn't change anything. Came back home, same prescription of my contacts. And I just stopped wearing it in my right eye because I couldn't see out of it with my contact in. Two weeks later, the same exact thing happens in my left eye. I literally cannot see out of it. I've changed the contacts. There are new contacts. There's no reason. I get back into him again. And he says, oh, your prescription has decreased after he runs a bunch of tests. My eye prescription had decreased significantly. Yeah. that <laughs> I I still, it's like the, at that time, I was like, I really wasn't thinking about how did that, is that attributed to my diet? But I didn't think about it. It didn't tell him anything about it. But I'm almost 100% sure that wouldn't have just happened on its own if I was eating all those inflammatory foods that I used to eat. Yeah, it's interesting. And I've seen a number of people now say that they're either their prescription got less or they no longer needed glasses or their eyesight has gotten better. I'm 56. I don't wear anything. I see fine. And it's one of those things where a lot of people my age are now using glasses to read and things like that. And it's remarkable. And I think there's some physiology that explains that. So you're not the first person to notice that their eyesight has gotten better since cleaning up the diet, which is cool. It's nice to not need that stuff. It's a, it can be a hassle to have to wear contacts or particularly glasses and things like that around all the time. The digestion got better. The big thing for you, it sounds like the cravings. When did you stop? Oh my gosh, I don't have cravings anymore. When did that happen to you? And how good did that feel? I guess when it occurred. That I mean, that was, I'm going to say a few months in, it, it wasn't right away. I still had my desire to, when the family would have dessert and things like that, I still wanted it. But now I know it's still food, but I really don't, I don't look at it that way because I don't, I know how it's going to make me feel. I know how I will feel the next day. And I also don't want to go down on that path that if there's half of a cake left, I might end up eating it if <laughs> once the party's over. So yeah, so that that went away. And then the most for me, the biggest thing was alcohol. That feeling that I needed that every day. As well, I was always be like after my work was done, after everything was caught up in just like a reward at the end of a busy day. And I I can still have a glass of wine or something. And I don't, so I don't know that I was a true alcoholic. I wouldn't even consider myself that. When somebody is drinking every day, I consider that somewhat a functioning addiction. I'm really glad that part of my life is over because I know that's a poison. No, it's not healthy. Yeah, there's certainly this is a functional alcoholic. And I know several of them, that they function well, but they just they drink every day and it's like, can't go a day without it. And so that's got to be, again, just so many wins here that, that you have 
you don't have cravings anymore. You say you you don't really view this as food anymore. I'm the same way. I go to the grocery store and I don't even I don't even consider most of it even food. I'm gonna look at it. I see all this flashy packaging, which would normally grab someone's attention, and you're just this doesn't interest me in the least bit. Again, it's really freeing. How did your family take this? Because they've seen you go from I, I'm sure your family, your your husband and stuff have got all, okay. Is just here's. Here she is, whether or not her next crazy adventure, is that kind of what they thought or did they see something truly different this time? It is what they thought in the beginning, especially when I'm eating eggs and bacon and red meat. That's my favorite actually of, of all the meats. So they saw me doing that daily. It's like when everyone's clothes are starting to smell like steak <laughs> and after you've washed them, it's very prevalent in the household. But everybody, my family loves meat. And since this has happened, Three of my family members have come on board at least Monday through Friday. <laughs> my daughter is who's expecting. She she did that test, the glucose test, and she had, uh, I guess, a true diagnosis of gestational diabetes. I'm trying to get it out. And uh, I said, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> so halfway through her pregnancy, she's carnivore, ketovore, but she went pretty heavy into it. She completely at first cut out all veg. So she pricks her finger and fasted every morning. And then after every meal, she's eating two meals a day, carnivore and some veg, not much. And her numbers are always, and it's so funny, her numbers, like she'll wake up in the morning, 87 glucose. She'll eat a steak and eggs hour after 87 glucose. It just runs even keel all day long for her. And I, at first I was having her send me her numbers, send me her numbers every day. And now we don't even think about it because I know they're good. And her OB doctor just said to her the other day, she's 38 weeks. And she says, I bet you don't even, <laughs> you don't even think that you have this. And she said, because you really, with those numbers, you don't. And she didn't want a C-section to be put on all these things that they'll do for you. It can be quite dangerous. So she went all in for something that's important to her, her baby. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's critically important to get a good nutrition while you're pregnant, particularly as you've got the baby depending on your food. What about... Because you said for years it was you would eat a little bit of salads and fruit and vegetables for snacks. And now you're like, I don't eat any of that stuff. How does it feel? How many, how do you rationally mentally think about I'm not having all these fruits and vegetables? They tell me I need to eat five fruits and vegetables a day to be healthy. And it's gonna, it's gonna how do you think about that these days? I think about it when I would lay there at night and churn because my gut was all upset from all that stuff. I can't. I will probably eat a salad again someday in my life and I'll just see how it works out for me. But it's been almost a year and I don't miss any of it at all. And it's really bad though, because we had a, ve a vegetable and fruit tray this Mother's Day weekend. And I'm like looking at that, like it's poison, <laughs> like, it's fruits and vegetables. It's not, they're eating it. And I'm thinking, oh, this is terrible. It's all good. They didn't, there's no junk food around. We didn't have crackers. It was just all, it was, it was good whole food. So I'm proud of my family. Several of them have come on board and actually lost some weight, actually. Not my pregnant daughter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, I can tell you, I'm seven years and I've got no desire to eat salad. I, I, that, that's like the last thing I'd want to eat. If I was going to cheat, like I said, it's going to be a piece of chocolate cake. It sure as hell isn't going to be a salad because it, it provides me one, no taste satisfaction. And two, it's like you said, it's basically gut pain is what that results in for me. So I, I don't, I could very conceivably see going the rest of my life and never eating another salad. I'd, I'd be very happy with that and very comfortable with that. What about you? You said you were running and exercise. Are you still able to do that? Or you still do that? Or how do you, is it yeah. something you feel like you have to do now? What are your thoughts around exercise these days? So I'm not as, I'm not as hardcore trying to get my 35 to 40 miles in running, pounding the pavement. That was another thing that's helped. My joint pain has I'm not going to say completely resolved, but just getting out of bed every morning with all those, those aches and pains that you just, oh, just because of my age. No, it's much better. I don't pound the pavement. I don't do excessive cardio. I'm a yoga instructor. We practice in about 105 degrees and about 50% humidity, and it's pretty high intensity. And then I walk my dog and I started lifting weights again because I just, I know that I need to keep my muscles strong to protect my joints because I've had so many issues in the past. So it's not excessive. Um, I will say it's at least six days a week and sometimes two hours a day, but that's not excessive for me. I'm not trying to get in seven miles a day or 20,000 steps a day. I'm not obsessive about it in that way. I just do what I do because I want to feel good. And the diet, this way of eating, I don't like to call it a diet. This way of eating makes me feel so good and so much stronger in all the things that I have to do. 
with my workouts and with teaching. Yeah. When you mentioned yoga, a lot of people associate yoga with vegetarianism, veganism. Do you see, is that a lot of what in the people that go to your classes or the classes you attend? And do you like ever say, hey, look, I'm just eating meat. Does that ever come up? Uh, the people that attend my classes, we're like, we're country bread corn fed out here. So I don't think a lot of them are saying, oh, darn, she's eating meat. But I get a lot of love hate on the, on the old Instagram profile. <laughs> a lot of yoga people reach out to me like, you're not a true yogi. That doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> so they're saying to be a true yogi, you have to be plant-based. Is that what they're claiming? Or is, tree hugger and yeah, plant-based. A lot of vegans have reached out to me through my page and yeah, reamed me or they'll tag me in posts about their ideas. And yeah. Well, I guess if it, if you're in there doing yoga and you got a bloated belly and you have gas the whole time, it's probably not so fun. I would imagine that sometimes occurs. Do you feel like you've gotten stronger now since you switched over to, to, to an all meat based diet? Yeah, I definitely have. Yeah. I can put muscle on easily. How and does that I'm not even trying really. That's got to feel good, I would imagine, doesn't it? Does it change? And does it change your mental outlook as well? Yeah, like the whole with my anxiety and then just the calmness. And um, yeah, just feeling stronger. It's not just physically, it's mentally. And we talk about that all the time in yoga. It's your mental, your spiritual, and your physical bodies. They're all connected. So you got to get them all in sync and eating this way, definitely getting those hormones in balance really gets it all in sync. When you say eating this way, so what does your diet look like these days? And you're, I don't know how, uh, you don't look like you're a big person. You look like you're relatively medium size. I don't know, hard to tell from the shoulders up, but how, if you might share your dimensions and if you don't mind how tall and how much you weigh currently and how much do you eat? How much does it require to, to keep you running? Um, I'm five foot four, about 125 pounds. I've gained a few pounds on carnivore and I think that's because my body needed to. I had a lot of healing to do and I was almost maybe too skinny. Sometimes that bothers me, but I try not to look at the scale. My waist size has stayed exactly the same. 27 inches has not changed at all. Yeah, I just, I still exercise quite a bit. I feel good. Sounds like you put on some muscle. So that's, yeah. you're getting stronger. So you, by almost by definition, you put on muscle with that. And so that's a, probably a good thing. And, but, I, but so what does your daily diet look like? Or your weekly yeah. diet? Or how does that look? Uh, pretty much beef, butter, bacon, eggs. And some dairy. I don't eat cheese weekly, but I have, I've come to have a little bit of a, I don't want to call it addiction, but I love my heavy cream. So I'm trying to watch that because it has a lot of calories and I think it has what 0.6 grams of sugar per serving. So I do try to limit that a little bit, but I think that's become my new dessert. I don't know if any of you can feel me on that, but it is, it's quite delicious once you froth it up and mostly ruminant meat. I don't think I've had a vegetable since before January and no fruit. And how much are you, do you think you're eating? How many times, are you, how many meals a day are you doing? Are you snacking a lot or is it mostly just a couple meals? And yeah, No snacking. I usually probably two meals a day, but I open up with a lighter meal and I would say probably 18 to 20 hour fast, intermittent fasting, just by not because I'm choosing to, just because I'm not hungry. <laughs> it just feels right. And I was intermittent fasting. I've done that for four years. I just, it's a routine with me, but I'm never hungry. I, when I do eat, I'm hungry, but I'm not going around the other 18 hours being like I'm starving and I'm going to have to binge and I'm going to have to eat poorly because I've deprived myself. I never feel deprived. If I'm hungry, I will eat. Yeah. That's, and that's something that I think is real important to feel like you're, you're getting enough nutrition during your meals. And so you don't feel like you need to continue to snack all the time. I don't know. You said you've got, you've got some kids, some grandkids. Are you, any kids still living in the house with you or is it just you and the husband who who's in the yeah, house? No, yeah. No kids in the house. So you guys are em empty, empty nesters at this point. And so how does your husband like in the diet? Is he on board with eating more meat or what is his he, thoughts? He just, he just started about a week ago eating some, eating mostly meat. At first he didn't think he could do it. We still have lots of chips in the pantry. And I still have a household that's got a bunch of crap in it that could be tempting, but I really am not tempted by it. If I don't have something like carnivore crisp or something in the pantry, if I go to the pantry, I'm not eating it. And I don't really snack anymore. So it's not that big of a deal, but I have one little section in the pantry and one little section in the fridge. That's mine. The rest is everybody else's, but he's trying. 
Yeah. Yeah. So like my, my food is basically, yeah, it's the freezer, the, the freezer for, I got a big stash of, it makes me feel good. Cause I got a freezer full of meat and then I, I bring, put some out in the fridge to thaw it out. And then I've got, I'll make, like I said, I'll make my own homemade carnivore crisps a lot of times if I, if I feel in the mood, but again, I really, rarely find a need to snack, which is interesting. Like you said, you just kind of eat when you feel like it. So you're not really focusing and counting like how many grams of protein I get or how much fat I consume. Are you leaning more to, to higher fat or do you just do whatever you feel like? I think I'm higher fat. I definitely, I don't eat very much chicken. So it's mostly higher fat. I would take a ribeye every day, but uh, I do eat a lot of hamburger because it costs less and a lot of eggs. And I'm going to say I probably keep a one to one ratio higher on the calories with the fat. I also had to cut back my butter. I was eating a little bit too much butter, I think, too. I'm not doing it. I know I don't know. The guys don't do the butter thing as much, but the girls, I don't feel like we migrate towards that for some reason. And I have to watch that also. Well, let me ask you about that. You said you were eating too much butter. Why do you say that? What do you think? What was happening that made you feel like that? Was just gaining more weight? I just or? felt like I was, I don't know. I felt like my legs were getting fat, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> yeah. This is something I always said. The amount of calories we consume does have a role here. Once you go carnivore, I mean, there's how do you gain weight? We eat more. How do you lose weight? You eat less. So it's still, there's still that, that occurs. And a lot of people, it seem like they just talk, but they're just eating unlimited sticks of butter, which I don't think really works out in practicality over the long term. You're in a hot place. You're in, you're, you're in the desert and out there near, I guess, near Phoenix, you said. Hydration, electrolytes, things like that. Is that something you concern yourself with? Yes. I take electrolyte packages once in a while, but not daily. I normally just take a pinch of salt and eat that. So it's cheaper. <laughs> and it gives me a little crunch when I'm still like in my fasting window. Let's talk about, you said cheaper because a lot of people will say, I can't, there's no way I could do this diet because it's too expensive. How does this diet compare to, compared to say your vegan diet or your standard or your dirty keto diet or any other diet you've done in the past? Is it prohibitively more expensive for you? And obviously you're doing it, so it can't be, but what are your thoughts on how much this costs me versus what was what I was spending? Because you, I mean, you were on a whole bunch of supplements at one point. Are you off all the supplements? And how much does the food cost you these days? Yeah, I'm off all the supplements except magnesium and iodine. And I occasionally take D3 and K2, but that's because I don't have very much sunshine here. I'm actually in Illinois. So. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I was thinking, yeah. never mind. So it's right. really cold here, right. here, but I'm almost wanting to wean off of that as well. So stuff, I was spending a lot of money, like hundreds of dollars a month. So I've cut down on that. I don't really buy anything in a box, bottle, jar, or bag for the most part. I just don't. So yeah, you can find hamburger on sale. You can find you can find T-bone steaks on sale. They're running like New York strips for $9.99 a pound. I don't think that's bad. Like, we can we go out to eat and it's $100 for really not great food. And then I never really get a good steak if I go out. And uh, we ate a Buffalo Wild Wings the other night, $90, $90. It was with a good tip too. But I think that's just ridiculous. I'm like, oh my gosh, no, we could eat a hamburger at home or a good steak. So it, I think I spend so much less. I just, I literally just, I don't even go to the grocery store anymore. I go to our meat processor, our meat person here. So find a good butcher and find the sales. Yeah. I think carnivore is not particularly good for the restaurant industry. Most of us are like, I can make a better steak at home for a hell of a lot cheaper. And so I, like I said, unless I'm on vacation, I don't have a choice. I rarely go out to eat, which some people would say is a downer, but honestly, if I want to socialize, I'll have somebody over to the house or go to their house. And I think that's a, that's something that a lot of people have, a lot of people have lost the ability to cook, which is uh, particularly younger generations where they just don't even know how to cook anymore. And it's just such an important vital skill. I think, I think, honestly, I think one of the, one of the larger factors for being able to eat healthy is to knowing how to prepare and cook your own food. And we're losing that as a society because we've just outsourced everything to packages and or convince or, or calling the restaurant with these Uber Eats and things like that, which I think it's just, I think it's no matter how convenient it might be, I think it's really a bad development. You said you had gotten some feed, negative feedback from folks on maybe social media. What are the main criticisms they have about what you're doing and why do they care? Why should somebody care how somebody else eats? Well, those people weren't concerned about my health. They were just concerned probably about the planet and the animals. And I don't really ever engage with them as far as that they are killing more animals than we do with their monocropping. <laughs> I just, I don't go there. I just think they don't like the whole yogi connection, yo yoga connection with being a carnivore. That's okay. 
I mean, like- isn't yoga supposed to be about health? And I assume that's why you go there to do some kind of healthy activity. And this has clearly improved your health significantly. I think no one can take that from you and say that my own personal experience has been, I've, it's been a year. Some people say, well, wait 10 years or whatever. And it'll be all the critics that will just say, one day you're going to die. Like they're not going to die or something like that. So that's the argument they're left with is one day you're going to get this or that. And one day we're all going to get this or that. It's really a, a poor argument in my mind. Do I'd like you, to see their lab numbers. Well, you're going to respect of lab numbers. And I think lab numbers can be very, there's some limited utility to that or some benefit, but I think we overemphasize the importance of lab numbers in many cases. I think it's more important to look at our actual function and how we actually are, are not just what's flowing through our blood at any given second of our life because it changes so frequently. What has been, let's talk about downsides. Has there any legitimate negatives for switching to an all meat diet? Is there any physical, mental health side effects, any negatives you that you've encountered? And if so, what, how did you deal with them? I can't, I can't really think of any, I really can't. I used to have, I used to have headaches and then I would sometimes take Benadryl to sleep at night or NyQuil taking ibuprofen daily for joints and aches and pains. And I don't take any over-the-counter medications. I've dropped down to three supplements that I take daily. Yeah. Saving all that money and not putting poison in my body and my liver's doing what it's supposed to do, producing, hopefully it is producing ketones. And I just feel so much better. I can't, I don't have one negative thing to say about it. And I've had my doubts. Everybody's like, oh, you're going to have a heart attack. You're going to have, you're going to have your cholesterol is going to skyrocket. And I just, Sometimes you have your doubts. You hear so many people saying those things to you, but I've had no negative repercussions from this way of eating. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. If nothing negative has happened to you, that's, that's true as well. It's we're not going to say that there has to be something negative. A lot of people will, and a lot of people will say, "Oh my gosh, you're eating all this saturated fat, and your cholesterol is going to go up, and you're going to have a heart attack." And again. We don't really have, we have some associational data. We don't really have any good randomized control trials that say someone eating. We definitely don't have any data on, on carnivores long-term outside of historical references where most of the historical populations that ate this way were free from, largely free from chronic disease. Or some people argue that some Inuit mum, mummies from the 1800s had clack, plaque in their arteries and things like that. But I'll point out that these people also smoke at a rate of about 70% of their population, which is well above national averages, which in the U.S. it's about 14%. So you're looking at the smoking role there. And most people would argue that, yeah, it does. Um, but you'd mentioned anxiety. And uh, this is the only time I've ever met you. You seem like you're, hand, you're, you're doing fine on an interview here. But how has the mental health side of things impacted you? Or how has the diet impacted the mental health side? My friend and I were discussing this. She's the one that actually introduced me to Vinny and then you as well. Just that we, I have this overall calm, just of how we react to situations. we It's almost like you you take your time, you respond, and you just don't get that racing heartbeat and just that horrible feeling of anxiety and angst because of a situation that maybe you can't control. or But by your response, maybe you actually can control it. So just for me, that, that part of it, yoga is supposed to have, yoga has helped me tremendously as well. But this really, like you said, yoga is all about feeling better. And so carnivore has just helped me feel even better in that, in, in my practice with yoga. <laughs> yeah. And you're, yeah, I'm just curious, because you said you had a friend who started at the same time. Is she also noticing significant improvements or? Yeah, we talk about it all the time. <laughs> our skin, so our skin, I got oh, I know this time of year, every year I go to the dermatologist and I have like things on my body frozen off, torso, back, chest, called age spots and skin tags. I have nothing this year that needs to be frozen off. I'm very happy about not even having to go there and have that done. <laughs> yeah, They're all gone. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the skin is a reflection of what's going on with the rest of our body. And so your skin health has gotten better. Have you noticed a lot of people notice hair gets thicker and nails grow faster. They're thicker, stronger. Uh, any other skin issues or hair nail issues that you've seen have gotten better? My hair stopped going gray. I've got, <laughs> this is all no color is my own natural hair. I know that's not going to work for everybody, but it got thicker, of course, a lot thicker and uh, crepey skin. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. The men may not, but the women sure know what the crepey skin is <laughs> on the legs. And yeah, that part has gotten a lot better. It's just almost like filled out and it's just nice, tight skin. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, some of the elastins and other collagen elastins, proteins and collagens and things like that, They it depends on us eating correctly, I think, in a way. And so supports our skin. Is, our skin becomes thicker, not so thin, but it's a thin skin is more fragile skin. And it's something that- Wrinkles. Uh, I've, I have less wrinkles. Well, that, that, that should be a selling point alone for a lot of women. Personally, I feel like I do. Okay. I still have wrinkles, but I feel like I do have less. Yeah. yeah and good. like all of us ladies want our necks to look good. Just things like that. Little things add up to a lot of, add up to big thing. Yeah. Big, there's, a lot, big there's, men. there's a lot of like little things we don't think about as health and aging, but it does. It has a role there. And I, I always point out the fact that I never hiccup anymore, which just seems weird, but it's just like, I, I don't even have hiccups and I never have them anymore. What's going on with that? So it's like diaphragmatic uh, irritation, which is no longer there. And so it's kind of just all these weird little tiny things that add up over time. You're right for a quality of life. Any other things that you've noticed? Obviously, eyesight and skin issues and anxiety better and digestion better. Anything else that you've seen that because you're you said you're 54, you're in this sort of perimenopausal time frame. Has that Carnivore, has going carnivore made that experience better for you? Yeah, my night sweats completely went away. And I'm sure that was had a lot to do with my cortisol levels. But uh, I started having my periods again regularly. So yippee yay yay I was thinking that would be over. <laughs> but I have no PMS. I have no, I have no, um, no warning, no forewarning that this is going to be happening. It just happens. And, and I've suffered with severe menstrual pains throughout the years. I had to wear a heating pad at night on my stomach and take ibuprofen. So that being gone is amazing. Carpal tunnel. I had carpal tunnel for on my left hand severely for many years. I could, I got to the point it was so bad. I couldn't even start IVs anymore because you have, I, I'm right-handed. So I had to feel with my left hand to start an IV. It was terrible. So <laughs> just really awful. And I would still occasionally have flare-ups with that. I never did have surgery. Yoga helped me with that because we do a lot of gripping in the practice. So yoga really helped, but I would still have flare-ups at night where the hands would, this hand especially would go numb. And so I don't have flare-ups anymore with my carpal tunnel. And I wake up, it's not just numb during the night, I would be numb all day in pain. And I don't have that anymore. If I once in a while have a sweet or something, which I have not done since January, I will have a horrible night's sleep and have the numbness in the left hand again. Yeah, it's amazing how that works. And a lot of people would say that that you're making it up, but I've seen that happen before. And it's interesting. I just, I wanted to ask you, because you said starting IV. So do you work in healthcare in some fashion? Or what do you do as far yeah, as... For, uh, I was in uh, at MRI, x-ray MRI mammograms, but mostly MRI for 35 years. And we saw a lot of change over the last 35 years of the our patients. They kept getting larger and larger over the course of 35 years. I think the average male female weight is probably 200 pounds. So you have to write a weight on everybody. It just started getting worse and worse over the years. Crazy. Yeah, you are correct in that the average weight has gone up significantly. I think, I think it's, I want to say the average male is now like five foot nine with a 40 inch waist. And I think it's right at 200 pounds. And the average female is around 170 and something like that. It's gone up significant, like 40, 50 pounds we're talking about. Uh, yeah. Just average weight. And with the MRI scanners, you'll get patients that, that just don't fit, that literally do not fit in the tube. Okay. And I, I remember I, I had as an orthopedic surgeon, I would have to literally send people, it sounds crazy, but I would send them to, to a scan. large mammal scanner in yeah. SeaWorld San yeah. Antonio to get scanned because we couldn't fit them in a human scanner. We would, these are these 500 plus pound people that you had to send them to the, the large mammal scanner and bring in vet places like SeaWorld. Which is crazy to think about. <laughs> you have humans that don't even fit on the human machines anymore. Gosh, we're almost out of town. This has been good talking to you. Tell me, Barbara, where you, you said you have some social media, and I know you also do some coaching. So tell us a little bit about those two things where people can go to follow more about yoga or your journey or maybe some coaching type stuff. My coaching is through carnivore.diet with, I guess, with Rivero. And just look up Barbara S. And I have my, my Instagram handle is carnivore underscore yogis, Y-O-G-I-S. That's where I get all my heat. <laughs> I also have a yoga one, lotusroomyoga.bjs, but all my carnivore stuff is on the carnivore yogis one. I have a lot of fun there. It's fun. Yeah. Good for you. And I don't know if, I don't know if she's, I don't think she's in here today, but Kiki is one of our yogi 
practitioners, also carnivores. She, I think she set the world record for the downward facing dog a while back and oh, like wow. an hour, over an hour of downward dog, which I, I imagine that seems like it's quite challenging to do, but she set that world record for a while. Yes. Uh, that. Well, anyway, I'll tell you what, I am so glad that you're feeling better and it looks like you found something that works really well for you and glad that you're sharing that with other people. And hopefully, like I said, this is what it's going to take is all of us sharing our stories and because we, we're not going to get this to CNN. We're not going to get it to the federal government. They're not going to be out there promoting a carnivore message because it doesn't align with their sponsors or their financial interests. And so we've got to, we've got to do it for ourselves. And thank you for being willing to do that. Sure. Keep up the good work. And if somebody's in, somebody's interested in a coaching session with you, they can go to carnivore.diet and look up. You said Barbara S to find one and uh, they can chat with you. Maybe they have similar, maybe they're in a similar situation to you. And like I said, a lot of people like to chat with somebody that has a similar story. So thank you for doing this, Barbara. Have a wonderful day. Uh, the rest of the folks, I am pretty sure I'll be here tomorrow. I've got to head to the UK. Uh, I'll try to make it tomorrow. So I've got, I'm flying out to the UK tomorrow. So thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, Barbara. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Bye guys. Take care. Okay. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.